Hey everybody, and welcome back to our series on how to use JASP in an introductory statistics course. So we're picking this back up at part five, which covers single sample t-tests. So now we're gonna get into the meat of most courses where you're dealing with hypothesis testing. I will tell you this setup is one that our department had decided on. And so you as a student in another course may not use all of this material, but we wanted to make sure that you had kind of the most that you might need. Okay. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a lecture and a little bit of how to kind of wrapped into one. Okay. So what is a single sample t-test? Well, it's used to determine if a single group or single sample is different from some predetermined population mean. So let's say you wanna know if the current SAT scores are higher than last year's SAT scores. So you only have one group of people and a known comparison point. These groups of people have been tested on one single independent var dependent variable. And so we might say, is the freshman class different than the overall university average? So the first thing we have to think about are the assumptions of a single sample t-test. Right? So assumption number one, we have one dependent variable that we've measured on these participants that's at least continuous. So that means it's either a ratio or interval scale. Continuous variables include things like hours, we could think about IQ, exam performance, weight, and others. Assumption number two is that the distribution of the dependent variable should be approximately normally distributed. And what we really mean by that is the distribution of the sampling distribution should be normal. The population for the dependent variable could be skewed, however, well, we should have a large enough sample to get the sampling distribution to be normal. And we'll show you how to check this in JASP. This assumption is um, required for any of our t-tests that we're going to cover, but generally t-tests are considered robust to violations of normality. That means that we can kind of bend the rules a little bit and still get a valid result with our t-test. So you can say maybe it's approximately normal data. As sample size increases, that sampling distribution can, um, can even more normalize using the central limit theorem. If you don't totally understand this concept and or the central limit theorem, I would tell you to look up distribution bunnies because this is probably the first time you've really encountered such a, a concept. And this is always what I search to find it. And it's usually this first video that pops up at Google for distribution bunnies. And it explains this idea of, of normality of the sampling distribution and um, why the population of data can actually be non-normal, but still for our sample, we can receive a, a normal sampling distribution. All right, that's assumption number two. Assumption number three is that there are no big outliers in the sample. So if we have any very unusual scores for our sample, they may be extremely small or extremely large compared to the other scores. Those scores tend to be called outliers. So let's say if one participant got nearly 100 and broke the curve on your math test, everybody else got 60s, that would probably be considered an outlier. Outliers can negatively affect many results based on means because we're comparing this group's mean to a known mean. And this is true for all, um, all t-tests. So they can have a really large effect on samples dealing with the mean. And what happens is that mean is pulled towards the outlier. So the skew of that distribution can cause problems. And then the standard deviations increased. So all of that adds noise to your statistical test because your sample's noisy. So Especially if you have a smaller sample size, outliers can be even more impactful. With larger sample sizes, they tend to kind of get washed out because they're one person in the sea of many. Right. The other thing that's probably somewhat new, um, you probably have covered z-scores, is this idea of null and alternative hypotheses. Okay. So we're going to make, uh, and at least in our classes, people specifically state the null and the alternative and then, ex then state whether this is accepted or rejected. Right. So a common null hypothesis for a two-tailed single sample test is that the mean is the same as the population. 
Okay, so nothing happened. Remember, this is called a null for a reason. And then for the research hypothesis, the idea is that the sample will be different. So something happened. So anytime you're thinking about null and alternative hypotheses, really kind of think about this like a, a police investigation. Okay, so the idea is to determine if something happened by rejecting the idea that nothing happened. Right? So this is kind of like backwards thinking and students often have a hard time with this kind of concept because it is not the easiest. <laughs> and um, so what I always think of is like police, right? Somebody makes a report, right? They have to find enough evidence to determine that something happened to reject this idea that nothing happened. Right? So false reports happen. And so we would want to make sure that something did actually happen, the research hypothesis, before we rejected this idea that nothing happened, the null hypothesis. So we're gonna use our sample to see if there's enough evidence, right, using um, p-values, to determine if we can reject that null hypothesis. But we don't ever accept the um, research hypothesis, but we can say it's not supported. All right, so we're mostly gonna cover two-tailed hypothesis testing where we don't really pick a direction. We're not saying one's greater or one's less than, but do know that JASP and often instructors will tell you to pick a side. Okay, so um, we can also talk about how to pick a side, but mostly these guides cover kind of two-tailed um, hypotheses where you don't say if you think it's higher or lower. So let's do an example. So a researcher's taken some data on privacy and the use of social media. Okay, 40 participants, so there's our sample size, were asked to rate their concern with online privacy. From one, not at all concerned, to seven, very much concerned. This data is then compared to a national average of concern, which has kind of a neutral score, with a population mean is 4.12. Now the first thing we really need to figure out is the descriptive statistics of the data that we have. So let's open JASP and pick our single sample t-test data. Since we've made this guide, they've updated JASP a little bit, but mostly this is the same. There's just no more file option. It's here under this hamburger icon. So we'll click open. Otherwise it's all the same, basically. Let's go to computer. I'm gonna find that single sample t data from our uh, guides here. Click open. So now we have a, an entire list of our privacy scores from one all the way down here to 40. I can't quite get down to the bottom here, 40. So let's go back. Let's check those assumptions. Is the dependent variable a least scale? Yeah, it's got interval style data. That's kind of Likert style one to seven. Are there any outliers? Well, let's see. So let's first examine the descriptives that we've looked at previously. So we're gonna to go to descriptives, descriptives, click privacy to move it over and move it to the right side and make a plot. So let's try that. Descriptives, descriptives, move over privacy to variables over here. You can double click on it or you can click the little arrow here. And that automatically pulls up the sort of basic uh, descriptive statistics like mean, standard deviations. Under plots here, I want to do a couple things. One of them might be a distribution plot. And what that shows me, same plot over here, is the distribution of the data. So the data itself kind of looks normal-ish, right? Maybe a little bit of skew. And most participants are between four and six. Maybe these one and twos are outliers, but it might be very hard to have an outlier on such a small scale. Another option would be box plots and tell it to label the outliers. We're also gonna click jitter just so all the dots don't lay on top of each other. So with jitter, all it does is it kind of like moves them left and right so that you can see a little better. So let's check that out. Box plot, label outliers, and jitter. So what we see is a box plot, which we'll go over what that is in just a second with a cool picture. And it calculates sort of the median of the data, um, the interquartile range, and it will put a, a number next to a particular outlier. 
when that number corresponds to the row of the data. Which remember, you can go back to the data, clicking this okay, or dragging, and that row number is listed here. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at what this box plot means because we labeled ours. This line here is the median. That is not the mean. This is the median, right? So the 50th percentile of the data. Okay. If the data is approximately normal, remember that the mean and the median are the same thing. Okay, but we don't know that yet. The main range here of the gray square is the first quartile, that's 25% of the data, and third quartile, 75% of the data. So this is where 75% of the data points lie, okay? between four and six which matches our pretty chart here. So a box plot is essentially a transformation of this histogram. Each of the dots here is a single person. Now if we didn't use that jitter, they would just be all plopped down right here on this middle line. So that jitter, the left and right part, doesn't really mean anything in this graph. It just allows us to see a little better, especially if you have multiple outliers, because then the numbers don't appear on top of each other. This last piece here is not the entire range of the data, although it happens to fall in this data set on the entire range. That is not how these are made. This is the um, quartile minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Okay, so what that does is it creates this sort of like spot on the edges and the outside of the distribution in which someone would be considered an outlier. There are lots of ways to think about outliers. This is just an easy way to check them in JASP. So effectively what it does is it takes that quartile, that bottom quartile, multiplies it times 1 times 0.5 times the interquartile range, which the heck is the interquartile range? This is the difference between the first and third quartiles. And then um, place, places a line up there. So in further data sets, you'll see when we have a larger range of data that this will not be everyone. It won't be the entire range of the data either. Okay, so you mainly would look for people whose dots fall outside this interquartile range. Okay, and they'll be labeled. Uh, in this data set, we don't have any outliers. So that's great. Okay. All right. Is the dependent variable normally distributed? So we're still checking assumptions. Well, we can look at that histogram we've already created. It looks pretty normal. But we might also consider the Shapiro-Wilk to see if the data is normal. Okay. To do that, we actually have to run the t-test to look at our output. So let's go ahead and run our statistical test. So we're gonna click on t-test and then one sample test down here. So let's go back and do that. t-test, one sample t-test. Okay, that pulls up this new window. Notice this new part of Jasper, it shows you all of the analyses that you've run kind of stacked together. That's really nice because then I don't have to just click on them as I did before, but you could still do that. So back to my one sample t-test. Okay. Gonna move privacy over here to the variables I'm interested in. This allows you to do multiple one sample t's. Okay. All right, let's go back. Okay. What we wanna do now is set the population mean. The default zero, so we're gonna change that. So be sure you change this. The thing that students miss generally is they forget to change this number here. That's why we put it in bold down here. Don't forget to do this or your t-test will be wrong. Okay, so let's change this to 4.12. How will you know what that number is? Well, um, the usually the question will tell you. Okay, you have to, someone has to tell you what the population mean is. Okay. Now you'll notice over here, I've already got an auto update. It went from having a t of like 47 to now a t of three. That makes a little bit more sense. Scroll down here, we can pick which hypothesis test we're interested in. We're gonna stick with the two-tailed test, but let's say for your assignment you need a directional test, you can do greater than or less than. And you'll notice that things are gonna change depending on what you pick down here. So let's see. For all tests, so it's quite tiny in the JASP window, the alternative hypothesis specifies that the population mean is different from 0.12. So if you're having to write these hypotheses out for your homework or for a test, it's right here in JASP. It tells you what the alternative should be. So pay attention there because you can check and make sure you've done it right. Great. And then here's an example of a one-tailed test. The alternative is that the mean is greater than 4.12 if we changed it. Right now we're going to uh, ignore the temptation to look at our p-value and actually check the normality. 
here under assumptions. So I'm going to come back over here to JASP. I'm going to pick um, the normality box here and allow it to pop up down here. Okay. All right. So if the data is normally distributed, i.e. the normality assumption is met, the significance value in that p-value should be more than 0.05. So when we're checking for assumptions, the rules are backwards. We don't want them to be significant because that means it's significantly bad. So I always tell students, like, you don't want it to be bad, and this would be significantly bad. If your data is not normally distributed, the assumption of normality is violated, the significance level will be less than 0.05. Okay. We're using 0.05 as our alpha value. Remember, you've probably learned about type 1 and type 2 errors. Okay. But you could change it. For my own research, I use 0.001. Okay. But in a normal uh, undergraduate course, people kind of stick with 0.05. But pay attention to what your instructor wants you to do. So 0.05 is not the answer. This is just a common rule. Okay. So the null hypothesis of a Shapiro-Wilk is that the distribution is normal. And that's what we want. The alternative hypothesis is the distribution is not normal. Okay. So if we reject that null hypothesis, this means that we have enough evidence to show that it's not normal. Okay. We haven't if we don't reject, right, we haven't proven that it's normal. We've just said there's not enough evidence to say that it's not normal. Okay. So remember, anytime you reject the null, you say there's enough evidence to support the research. Okay. And if you don't reject the null, you say there's not enough evidence to support the research. Okay. All right, so here we see that our data is not normally distributed because our p-value is less than 0.05. Okay. So t-tests are generally fairly robust to violations of normality, especially in larger sample sizes. There's kind of a rule of n equals 30, you know, greater than 30. That's one of those kind of misconceptions in, in, um, in statistics. But generally, after about 30 people, the sampling distribution is normal. So we should be okay, um, even though our data may not be completely normal. All right, let's finish running that t-test and get some of the extra pieces that are very useful in interpreting a t-test. Okay. Now on some t-tests with violating normality, we could switch to maybe a Wilcox and signed rank test. Um, this will depend on what your instructor wants you to do. We're gonna say that it's maybe a little non-normal, okay, a little bit of skew, um, and just report that. All right, so let's add location parameter and get our confidence interval here. Let's add effect size, and you may or may not want the confidence interval for that. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, that location parameter, that depends on what your instructor wants. Um, I will always tell you to add effect size, that's my jam. Let's add some descriptives here. Okay. And so you should end up with this kind of extra box. So let's look at what the one we have here is. Okay, the only thing I've really added, here's the descriptive sound here, is that I've actually calculated um, a confidence for the mean difference. That mean difference here is the difference between your student's score and the population mean. So sometimes instructors want this, sometimes they don't. And that's how you'd get that mean difference, a confidence interval for the difference. You can also add the confidence intervals in a descriptives plot. Now this is not very exciting plot just because we only have one mean. Okay. All right, so let's look at this t-test box first. Okay. So that t-value is the test statistic for the difference between our sample and population mean. And remember that t-values are the difference between mean and population mean divided by standard error. So that's the difference on the top and the error on the bottom. And there's a really great YouTube video that has this nice kind of wrap format. <laughs> um, but we always, in our statistical tests, you usually have some form of difference on the top, error on the bottom. Okay. And what changes is the error, the way we calculate that, because we have different types of, of research design, and we have to control for the fact that maybe we have two groups instead of one. All right, second box here is the degrees of freedom. 
and a single sample t-test, this is n minus one, okay. followed by our p-value, which is a, a measure of how different that is from what you might expect if the null was true. Okay. And let's say we've set our alpha, or type one error rate, at p less than 0.05. Okay. So we can also use 0.10 or 0.01, 0.05 is really popular. If our found p-value is different from our alpha p-value, this means that we have enough evidence to support that the sample and population are different and the test is what we would call statistically significant. Okay. If the p-value is not less than 0.05, we don't have enough evidence and we don't have statistical significance. Okay. In this particular example, the significance level or the p found for our study is 0 0.001 and so that means that it's less than 0.05. Okay. So it's super important to remember that the level of significance or the found p value is what I like to call this to not confuse this with alpha okay. does not tell you how important this is. It does not tell you the strength of the effect. Okay. So if you can't, don't try not to say more significant so your instructor doesn't cringe. And so it's the likelihood that this mean difference is larger, larger than the one, than a null difference. So uh, this mean difference in our case is different from zero um, or that our sample group is different from our population group. Okay. So if this example had produced a p-value of 0.012, that doesn't mean it's twice as strong or as important as p less than 0.24, p equals, sorry, 0.24. It's simply trying to inform you whether the mean difference is uh, not a fluke or really that it's a, maybe we would expect to find this in the population um, and not just our sample. Okay. So that's one thing we would like to dispel, I think, in our statistics courses is the more significant, okay? or that somehow significance tells me it's important. The last statistic that we've reported here is D, and this gives you an idea of the effect size. Okay, effect sizes are meant to represent the size of the effect. This is what gets into maybe importance. Okay. Now, uh, generally stats classes teach this Cohen's effect size rules two, five, and eight for small, medium, and large. Uh, different people have different feelings about this. Um, personally, I think it matters what's normal in your research field, but you know, you're taking a statistics class, so we're gonna give you some guidelines to interpret these values. Okay. So our effect size from our study is 0.56. Okay. And so we would say that's maybe a medium effect. Okay. And so um, <clears throat> generally there's usually more than one way to do this. But for a single sample T test, Cohen's D is the most common set of common, common thing reported. Right? All right. So to report this in APA style, we might do T, put your degrees of freedom in the parentheses, okay, equals throwing your T value, P equals okay, 0.001. Now, if the test up here says 0, 0, 0, Okay, I think it actually will show you less than 001, but if it up here shows you 000, P cannot equal zero, it's a probability value. And the probability of something, if you can remember dumb and dumber, is never a zero. So we would put P less than 0.001. In our study, we would put P equals 0.01 because that's what's in the box. We have D equals 0.56. Generally, there's two decimals except for p-values, which or APA asks you to do three. All right. To report the Shapiro-Wilkes, you might say the assumption of normality was not met as assessed by Shapiro-Wilkes and include the p-value. There's no extra. Some people report w, but generally people just report p. The last thing that we've got in here is our descriptives, okay, which we calculated here. And we always want to include these values so people can test for themselves whether or not we've done this correctly. Because generally with enough reported statistics and their descriptives, we can kind of backwards see like, okay, this looks correct. 
So the participants in their study uh, rated their concerns as mean, grab that from the mean box, and the standard deviation. Some people like to report standard error. One or both are fine. Generally one will get you close enough. Um, and then the other thing that people sometimes report is the mean difference score, okay. which we can get from up here. If you're asked to do confidence intervals, okay, you can include the confidence interval of the mean difference. Okay. There's not a good way at the moment that I see to get the confidence interval of the, of the main descriptive here without calculating that by hand, because while the plot is really cool, um, it doesn't show you the numbers. <laughs> Now, we might have been able to get that from up here. Let's see. But I don't also don't see the confidence interval option. Check. Uh, IQR, range, variance, skew, kurtosis. So we actually could have gotten the shapiro wilk test up here as well. Uh, no, I don't see confidence intervals. So we could also kind of hack together some percentiles, but if you remember the formula for confidence intervals, oop, um, it's fairly easy. Okay. So reporting it all together, single sample t-test was used to determine if our 40 participants' privacy concerns were different than previous studies. Okay, we've got mu listed here, the little u, because that is a population parameter. Okay. No outliers were found, Participants in this study rated their concerns, so I'm reporting the descriptives here. Working through the assumptions still, the assumption was of normality was not met. Okay. And then the test itself. The participants rated their privacy concerns as significantly different from the population. Okay. And since we've done these a while ago now, I'd say there's maybe one more sentence I might add here. This result implies the medium that your participants rated their scores higher. Okay, they are different, but practically 4.8 is higher than 4.12 with a medium effect size. So it actually interpret what the numbers mean. And I'll add that sentence down here at the bottom. But basically we're interested in, in what do these scores actually mean? Because many people can write these sorts of paragraphs and then not tell you what do the results actually mean. Well, they're different. Well, what does that mean? Our group seems to be a bit more concerned about privacy than the population with a medium effect. All right, so that's how you run a single sample t-test in JAS, checking for your assumptions and all the way through writing that up.